Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 1 to 13, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, There in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 to 13. As you're turning there, let me just say that all of us in this room share something in common. Each one of us is uncertain about our tomorrow, about our future, and what it will hold. We all have that in common. If, uh, if you're new parents, you've got a, a new child, what will our first year be like? If uh, you're starting college in the fall or starting high school in the fall, will I be liked? <laughs> uh, will the friends like me? Will I like them? What will my teachers be like? Uh, maybe you're starting a new job and you're wondering, you know, after a year from now, will I still like my boss? Or I'm unemployed, looking for a job. What happens when my savings runs out, if I even have any? Will I have enough money put away so that I can retire finally? What is the future going to hold? And what will the future be for me if I find out this year that I have cancer? Will 2023 be my last year? You know, with uncertainty, there's always a measure. We know it to be true, right? There's always a measure of human fear when facing the future. Our passage this morning finds Israel in the same situation. They were facing uncertainties as they stood overlooking the Jordan River into the Promised Land. For Moses, you know, he spent most of his life squeezing sand between his toes looking forward to that day when he would be able to enter the promised land. And yet, because he broke faith with the Lord, God told him that you will not enter the promised land. You'll lead people up to the promised land, but you won't go into it. Instead, I want you to climb Mount Nebo, and there you're going to die. How would you like that future? And then you've got Joshua. He faced uncertainties as well in our text this morning. He would have to conquer and possess the land of the Canaanite nations. Who in their right mind would want that kind of a future? And this this generation, this new generation, the ones that buried their parents in the wilderness, they would be the ones entering the land flowing with milk and honey. But not without war and not without the cost of the lives of their young men. I wonder if you can just feel just a measure of their apprehension and fear. Maybe it might remind you of your own and what you may be facing, the balance of this year. If you're as human as they, you need this passage and you need to hear it carefully and take it in. We, like Israel, need confidence in something that that won't disappoint us when we face the uncertainties of our own future. Verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 31. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today and am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. 
Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children, who have not known it, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess." The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, as we approach your word this morning, we pray that you would make your word move through our entire being, passing from our ears to our hearts, from our hearts to our lips and our conversation. Just as the rain and the snow from heaven does not return empty, so neither may your word to us. Search us and find that place in our lives where your word will transform us. We pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. On December 21st, Americans were glued to their television sets. Perhaps you remember that time as the Ukrainian president Zelensky delivered an impassioned speech before a joint Congress. His courage and his strength have won the hearts of people all around the world, including his own people in Ukraine, and have also earned him Time's Person of the Year. But equally impressive was the fact that he was on the eastern front line with his soldiers the very day before he addressed joint Congress. It's amazing, and the story behind that. And in his speech, he said these words. In two days, we will celebrate Christmas, maybe candle it, not because it's ro more romantic, no, but because there will not be, there will be no electricity. Millions won't have neither heating nor running water. To draw strength and courage for the Ukrainian people, Zelensky then quotes President Franklin Roosevelt, who said these words, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Well, as great as this righteous might was that led to the defeat of the Axis powers in World War II, and as great as Ukraine's righteous might is in defeating the Kremlin's regime, it is infinitesimally small compared to the righteous might that Israel had and you need as you face your own future and the uncertainties therein. You see, my friends, our righteous might is not found in the legs of men, nor is our righteous might found in positive outcome thinking. No, it's found in Yahweh alone. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the mighty El Shaddai. At his bidding, the stars and the galaxies, they all move in their courses. At his bidding, the hearts of his enemies melt like wax before him. As the psalmist sings, who in the skies can compare to the Lord. Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? You know, our passage this morning reminds us that no one can comprehend the greatness of God. We try with our finite minds, we try to understand God, but my, our minds are finite. It's hard for us to comprehend just 
really how great Yahweh really is. But it also reminds us that he must be our only source of confidence when we face the uncertainties of our own future. It was true for Israel and it will be true for us today if we were to face the future unafraid. Yahweh says to Israel and also to us, be strong and courageous. You've heard that phrase before, I'm sure. You've seen it in Joshua as well. Be strong and courageous. He goes on to say, do not fear or be in dread of them. And I wonder if this reminds you of what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, when he writes, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Same concept, same thing that Paul says. If you were to transport back in Israel's day for them, it would be before the Canaanite nations. For you and, you and me, well, Paul says it best when he writes, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So the grammar that's used in this passage, this very well familiar passage, is really quite interesting. It says a lot more than what you might think at first. The grammar used with be strong and courageous is different than do not fear or be in dread. They both sound like imperatives, or as we would refer to them as commands. Do this, do not do that. They sound like commands. But in fact, only be strong and courageous is in the imperative. That is the command to obey in this passage. Do not fear is actually a statement of fact. If you read it literally, it is, you will not ever fear or be in dread. Be strong and courageous. You will not ever live in fear or dread. So what does this little grammar lesson mean for you and me? Where does, it, where does the rubber meet the road for us? What difference does it make? When we are strong and courageous in Yahweh, there will never be a reason for fear or dismay to fill our thoughts. Never a reason that should keep us up at night toiling and wondering what the next day is going to bring. Never a reason, never a circumstance, neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, that we should ever be afraid. That's what God says in his word. Oh, I hear your minds, they're going. I hear what some of you are saying, uh, yeah, sure sounds good, but you don't know my situation. And plus, I'm just human. I'm an emotional creature. <laughs> Listen, when I, when I discovered this, when I studied this passage, I struggled with this as well when I studied this passage. I'm in the same boat. I need different than you. And I wrestled with this as well. But I also know that God's word makes it very clear that obedience is required in spite of how we feel about the matter. It's always required no matter how we feel. Yahweh is telling us that when we choose to be strong and courageous in him, fear is replaced by confidence in his righteous might, in the righteous might of Yahweh. When you step back for a moment and kind of take a bird's eye view of this passage, you really begin to see this passage is really more amazing than what meets the eye. It shows just how great Yahweh is. For example, he, he tells Israel that when they battle the Canaanite nations, these nations will be destroyed right in front of their eyes. Look at verse 3. Moses says, The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them, and Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. Although the battle must happen in real time, it's as good as done. 
And Israel was to be confident in that fact. Good is done. They were to be confident in what the Lord, what Yahweh told them. But this passage also shows just how much, how much they needed him. Moment by moment, Israel still had to march forward into the enemy. Still had to march. They still had to fight in spite of how they felt about it. You know, you don't realize how much you need the Lord until you're in the heat of the battle, right? You don't realize just how serious it is, but it's always in the heat of the battle. It's always in the battle where confidence is forged and strengthened and made into an oak tree. Here's the point. Write it down. Don't miss it. You'll need it next week. You'll need it several times, perhaps. Right in front of their eyes, they would see Yahweh's covenant promises carried out. Israel's strength and courage would lie, here it is, it would lie in the disposition of their minds during the battle. That's the point. Though they would be engaged physically in battle, their minds would not be focused on the enemy whose threatening presence could undermine their confidence in a second. But instead, they would fix their minds on Yahweh, who would not fail or forsake them, who promises to go ahead of them, and then to walk with them in the heat of battle. Now, this is all covenant language. But in the same way, whatever we face in our future... Whatever you will face on Monday morning, unknown to you, or Wednesday afternoon, whatever you will face in your future, our strength and our courage come from being preoccupied with Yahweh and his covenant promises. That should be your default thinking. Whenever you are short financially, whenever you hear the news of an illness, your default response should re go right back to the Lord's covenant faithfulness. His covenant promises. I'm reminded of Isaiah 26. When he writes, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. There are, uh, there's a family in our church at URC who has a little boy named Drew who has been struggling with leukemia for the past year and a half. And what's amazing to me is the faith that his parents and the family have demonstrated in the midst of setback after setback after setback. I mean, their response is it defaults to God's word and his promises. You see it so clearly. A family in the church that I pastored up in New York, upstate New York. Um, their little girl was born when I left the church. Now she's in her late 20s and dying with cancer. And it's amazing how Phil and Annie, just how they speak of the Lord's goodness in the midst of such hardship and uncertainties about the future and continual setbacks that they have. It's amazing to see it in real life, to see it in the lives of people. It, it challenges us. It encourages us. It makes us ask questions. How would we respond? Well, God's word tells us how we ought to respond, how we ought to live through those times. The key for facing the future on our, unafraid is keeping our minds fixed on Yahweh no matter what comes our way. This is the heart and center of what the Lord is telling his people through Moses, and then he tells them through Joshua. You see, Yahweh doesn't deal with us in abstracts. No, he gives us truths to anchor us to his promises. You know what an anchor does? It secures the object to which it's attached. He anchors us to his promises. He anchors us to his covenant promises in his word. 
Verse 9 tells us that Moses wrote this law down. Presumably, he wrote the entire book of Deuteronomy. It was to be read periodically. And according to chapter 32, portions of it were to be sung by the people. They were to sing it, to sing God's word. Reading God's word, singing God's word, obeying God's word, memorizing God's word, practicing God's word, making this a regular part of your life. It's these disciplines that anchor us to his covenant faithfulness when the uncertainties hold sway over us. Holding on to his word keeps us stable, keeps us firmly in place when the uncertainties drive hard against us. We're reminded that Yahweh goes before us. He's conquered all of his and all of your and our enemies. That is, he has conquered the very things that would weaken your faith in him. It is not at all deliverance from the circumstances, but no, it's deliverance from the effects that they can have on your faith to keep you loving and serving the Lord today when you had hardship yesterday and you've not abandoned the Lord. You're still here. You're still serving him. And that ought to bring great encouragement to your soul. The Lord has not forgotten you. He's continuously walking with us. Every moment of every hour and of every minute, we're never left alone. He never leaves us by the wayside. But his covenant promises are embedded in his word and it leaps into our minds. It leaps into our hearts where we're reminded I will be your God and you will be my people forever. My friends, if you are struggling with fear and dismay in your life, what are you feeding on that promotes it? What are you occupying your mind and your thoughts with that's feeding that fear and dismay? But I can tell you when you feed on his word, when all you have to wake up to in the morning literally is an open Bible with God's word, when that's all you have, then you will find your confidence in him increase. That is the safest place to be in his hand totally reliant, totally dependent upon the covenant promises that are made to you, his people, in his word. It's the safest place that you can be on Wednesday morning, on Friday evening. It's the safest place that you can be. But he doesn't stop there. He gives you more. He gives us more. He anchors us to his covenant promises, not just in his word, but also in Christ, who is our final mediator. In our passage that you heard read this morning, we see a progression of leadership, of what we call mediatorial leadership. Moses had completed the work of the prophetic mediatorial office. He was God's prophet. He was God's mediator between him and between man. But he had completed the work that God had given to him. Why? Because he couldn't go into the promised land. He was to go up to Mount Nebo and die. He had spoken and written the covenant kingdom word of Yahweh. He proclaimed it and he explained it. But now the task, the royal task of commanding and leading Israel into the promised land was incomplete. It still awaited Israel. And so in a very dramatic fashion... Would have been wonderful just to be there at that moment to see the people's reactions. At that moment, Moses turns from addressing Israel directly to now addressing the one who would assume this leadership. It would be Joshua or Yeshua, whose name means Jehovah is salvation. Look at verse 7 of our passage. Moses says these words, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, 
Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So this leadership, which is now all of a sudden on Joshua's shoulders, would now continue taking the people of Israel into the promised land. And that leadership would continue all the way through David, King David, and all the way on to King David's greater son the Lord Jesus Christ, who would fulfill Yahweh's covenant promises. And so just as Yeshua of the Old Testament, Joshua, we know him by, led Israel across the Jordan into the promised land where they would eventually enjoy rest and peace from wandering and warfare, so also Yeshua of the New Testament leads his people into the presence of God, and gives them eternal Sabbath rest. It's Christ. This passage foreshadows the work of what Christ would do when he would take his people into that eternal Sabbath rest. Listen, when, when you are finding yourself facing the dark providences of God in your future, turn your thoughts to Christ Keep them there. Rest in his protective armor that he gives you, that he provides so that you can stand firm in the evil day. He is your conquering mediator. He has fought and he is fighting for you, his people. And then finally, he anchors us to his covenant promises, not just in his word, not just in Christ who fulfills the covenant promises, but he anchors us to his covenant promises in his full salvation. Everything will be yours. All things. Israel was to regularly get together, assemble themselves together, men, women, and children. Why? So they could hear Yahweh's law read and that they would obey it. Much what you're doing here is the same thing they did then. You are gathered together. You have your children here. You are hearing God's law read so that you might learn to love him, that you might learn to fear the Lord and to trust in the Lord. You're doing the same thing Israel did centuries ago. Yahweh made them from parents to their children to be his precious possession, a kingdom, a priestly people, a holy nation, possessors of the revealed will of Yahweh and full recipients of his gracious covenant promises. You know this. Peter reminds us in his epistle that we're in this privileged position only by God's mercy. Out of his abundant mercy, he made us to be a kingdom and priest. We therefore have possession of all of these covenant promises. We don't earn them in any way so that we might lose them. No, he gives, to them, gives them to us freely and generously. The Lord pours out his blessings so much so that we have no reason to fear or be dismayed. Or another Hebrew translation of the word dismay in the Old Testament is to be shattered, to fall apart. To come to pieces. Why? Because we are his. And he is ours. And this applies to our covenant children who are sitting beside you as well. He puts his spirit in us as a down payment for what is to come. This spirit is the fulfillment of his covenant promise foretold by the prophet Ezekiel. We can be strong and we can be courageous without fear and dismay because Yahweh is our righteous might. Not positive thinking, not our ingenuity, but because Yahweh is our righteous might. He gives us his covenant promises in, in his word and he fulfills all the covenant promises in his son, our mediator. And he makes us full recipients 
of all of his covenant promises. As a result, he is not only our source of confidence, but he also is our source of perfect peace when we face the future and we're to do so unafraid. It was 1876, while on vacation, that Francis Havergal caught a cold that led to inflammation of the lungs. She was told that she might die. Her response was, if I am really going, <laughs> it's too good to be true. She would continue struggling with her health for the next several years. And when it was apparent that Francis was dying, the doctor left the room saying to her, Goodbye, I shall not see you again. Then you really think I'm going? Yes, said the doctor. Today? Probably. Beautiful. Beautiful, said Francis. Too good to be true. Splendid to be so near the gates of heaven. He is so good to take me now. There was a brief rush of convulsions that she had. And after they had finished, her nurse laid her back on her pillow. And when she calmed, she tried to sing. But after one sweet high note, he, Francis slipped into her mediator and redeemer's hand for eternity. She lived and she died with the very word she penned before her death. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Let's pray.